Hello. I'm going to read Lewis and Clark, Explorers of the American West by Stephen Kroll, illustrated by Richard Williams. Look at their interesting clothes. It looks like they're wearing deerskin clothing. Okay, this starts out by talking about the Louisiana Purchase. And I'll show to you the map while I read it. In 1803, the United States was just 20 years old. There were 17 states in the Union, and American territory reached only as far west as the Mississippi River. On the other side of the Mississippi, between the river and the Rocky Mountains, was the unexplored Louisiana Territory. In 1800, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of France, had taken Louisiana back from Spain, who had ruled it since 1763. President Thomas Jefferson did not want the French army threatening America's western border. He wasn't ready to risk the closing of the port of New Orleans at the mouth of the Mississippi and vital to American trade. In March 1803, Jefferson instructed his minister to France, Robert Livingston, to buy New Orleans from Napoleon. Napoleon had been unable to put down a slave rebellion in Haiti led by the great black general Toussaint Louverture. Soon he would be fighting another war with Great Britain. Involved in too many places at once, he decided to get out of North America. He offered to sell the whole of Louis the Louisiana Territory for 60 million francs, about $15 million. Jefferson felt this new land should be explored. Even before the United States took possession of the territory late in 1803 and early in 1804, the president had been discussing an expedition to the Pacific Ocean. On June 20th, 1803, President Thomas Jefferson asked his private secretary, Captain Mary Weather Lewis, to lead an expedition from the Mississippi River to the West Coast. Lewis agreed. As co-leader, he chose William Clark, who had once been his commanding officer in the army. On their journey, they would explore ways of opening the fur trade. They would try to find a water route across the continent that would make travel easier. They would also study the land and animals and learn more about the Indians in the West. <clears throat> the expedition was called the Corps of Discovery. Between December 1803 and May 1804, it took shape at the mouth of the Wood River where the Missouri and the Mississippi Rivers meet. Clark trained the men while Lewis spent much of his time in St. Louis making preparations. In the party were 14 soldiers, nine volunteers from Kentucky, Clark's slave, York, two French river rivermen, an interpreter, and Lewis's Newfoundland dog, Seaman. There were also nine rivermen and seven soldiers who went along for extra protection in the wilderness. These extra men planned to return home that fall. Here's a picture of his dog, black Newfoundland. On a rainy Monday, May 14, 1804, Clark and the men started up the Missouri. Lewis was in St. Louis and would join the expedition in a few days. The group traveled in a 55-foot keel boat and in two huge dugout canoes called pirogues. They led two horses along the bank to bring in game shot by the hunters. The boats carried clothing, tools, scientific books, medicine, rifles, goods for trading with the Indians, and a special powerful air gun to impress them. In case they had no other transportation, Lewis had included a collapsible iron canoe he called the experiment. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'd want to ride in a boat called the experiment. Hmm. In the event they ran out of food, he had brought a thick, gooey, portable soup. Hmm. After two days, the Corps of Discovery reached St. Charles. Five days later, Lewis joined them, and their journey began. The swift current and sandbars of the Missouri were made rowing hard and pulling difficult. Often the men had to tow the boats through the muddy waters. Lewis frequently walked on shore, taking notes on plants and animals. Clark stayed with the boats, mapping their course. Here's a picture of him taking notes on plants and animals. That's Lewis right there. 
It got very hot. Mosquitoes, gnats, and ticks tormented everyone. Some of the men got sick, but the hunters kept the group well stocked with game. And on July 21st, they reached the mouth of the Platte River. High on a bluff, three days later, they met with Oto and Missouri Indians. Lewis and Clark couldn't understand the Indian language. Their interpreter, George Drouillet, translated the Indian Sign Language. Lewis gave a speech about peace and trade with Americans. He told them that the great father in Washington wanted the chiefs to visit. Then he draped medals from President Jefferson around the chiefs' necks. He fired the air gun, hoping the noise would awe them, make them go, wow. Soon after, Sergeant Charles Floyd died of a burst appendix. He was the only member of the expedition to die during the two years, four months, and nine days of the journey. That's actually pretty amazing. The only, the only person to die in that long of a journey over such dangerous lands. Pressing on, the men began to see animals they had never even imagined. Antelope, prairie dogs, a white pelican, jackrabbits, coyotes. As trees became fewer, buffalo herds seemed to blanket the land. They were everywhere. <laughs> On August 20th, the Corps met with a friendly tribe of, tribe of Yankton Sioux. A few weeks later, they discovered that their cousins upriver, the Teton Sioux, were not so friendly. The Corps spent four tense days with them before meeting the more hospitable Eric Caras, who were farmers. They admired Clark's slave, York, the first black man they had ever seen. Toward the end of October, the expedition stopped for the winter near the villages of the Mandan and Hidatsa Indians. The men completed Fort Mandan on November 20th. The fort had eight connected log cabins arranged in a V with a high fence at the open end. I like that there's a picture of the fort, they had to build that, build that, you know, the men completed Fort Mandan. And then there's also pictures, there's a picture of a Hidatsa Indian, a Teton Sioux, a Mandan, and a Yankton Sioux. Take a look at those. I'll give you a minute to look. It's interesting how they have different ways of doing their hair. And here's the fort that they built. So they must have had to dig pretty deep holes to put those pointy topped tree um, trunks in. So they had to cut down trees, obviously. They sharpened the one end and then the other end they put in the ground. I wonder how, how far they had to dig to get those to stay in there and not just fall over. Because if you try putting a piece of wood in the ground, if you don't dig it very deep, it just falls over. Somebody could just push on it and go boop. Try it. Snow, ice, and below zero temperatures made everyone miserable. But the riverman Pierre Cruzat lifted everyone's spirits by playing his fiddle as the group danced at Christmas. The Mandans and Hidatsas welcomed the explorers to their large round lodges. The Hidatsa chiefs told Lewis and Clark what they knew about the geography of the Rocky Mountains. During the winter, Toussaint Charbonneau, a French Canadian living with the Hidatsas, joined the expedition as an interpreter. <clears throat> His teenage Shoshone wife, Sakagawea, joined too. On February 11th, Sakagawea gave birth to a son, Jean Baptiste. On April 7th, 1805, Lewis and Clark sent several soldiers and rivermen back to St. Louis on the keelboat. They were to take four magpies and a prairie dog, boxes of skins and horns. Indian articles, small samples of soil and plants, and Clark's maps and charts to President Jefferson. That same day, the Corps of Discovery, now numbering 32 and a baby, pushed on upriver into the unknown. They traveled in the two pirogues and in six dugout canoes they had made during, during the winter. It stayed cold, but the plains were green and game was everywhere. The Corps began to encounter grizzly bears. Lewis first saw the Rocky Mountains on May 26th. He wrote in his journal of his joy, but also of the difficulties which this snowy barrier would most probably throw in my way to the Pacific. 
Already he seemed aware that no river could come close to crossing these mountains, that there would be no water route to the west coast. Do you see what his hat, some of these hats are? Take a look at his hat. It's the skin of an animal, but with the head still on it. On June 2nd, the expedition came to a fork in the river. Which branch was the Missouri? If the explorers made a wrong choice, the passes through the Rockies might be blocked off by snow before they could reach them. The North Fork was muddy like the Missouri, the South Fork clearer and gravelly as if it had come from the mountains. Only the captains preferred the second choice. Lewis went ahead on land to explore the South Fork. When he reached the Great Falls of the Missouri River on June 13th, he knew he and Clark had made the right choice. The falls were magnificent, but there were so many, it took a month just to get around them. With bleeding feet, the men made makeshift wagons and cleared 18 miles of undergrowth. There were hailstorms, mosquitoes, rattlesnakes, and grizzlies. When they finally struggled back to the Missouri River, the experiment's buffalo hide cover leaked and it was left behind. Look at how they, look at how they had to try to get those Boats moved with everything in them. That's a lot of work, a lot of perseverance. They didn't give up though. On July 19th, the Corps passed through a huge chasm Lewis named the Gates of the Rocky Mountains. When they reached the three forks of the Missouri, Sacagawea declared that the Hidatsas had kidnapped her from the Shoshones at this very spot. Lewis and Clark named the three forks the Jefferson, the Madison, and the Gallatin rivers. They took the westernmost one, the Jefferson. When they turned up a stream into the mountains, they began to realize they would need horses to continue. From Sacagawea, the Corps knew they were in Shoshone territory. When they found a tribe from which they hoped to get horses, the chief, Kamiawe, turned out to be Sacagawea's brother. Sacagawea helped interpret. The Corps traded goods for horses, hid their canoes by sinking them with stones, and set out over Lemmy Pass to the Lemmy Fork of the Salmon River. A week later, through snow and sleet, they struggled over Lost Trail Pass into Flathead Valley and a camp they called Traveler's Rest. Then they followed the Lolo Trail across the Bitterroot Mountains. Wet, cold, and hungry, they could find no game. When Lewis's portable suit became unbearable, they killed and ate a colt. And a colt is a baby horse that's also a boy. Reaching the Clearwater River, the Corps met a tribe of friendly Nez Perce, or Pierced Nose Indians. Chief Twisted Hair agreed to look after their horses until their return. On October 7th, they started down the Clearwater to the Snake and Columbia Rivers in five dugout canoes they had made during their visit. Sometimes the men lowered the canoes through the rapids on ropes. Other times they ran the rapids or carried everything around them. When they glimpsed an Indian in a sailor's jacket, they knew their goal was near, and they reached the Pacific Ocean in mid-November. It rained all winter. We know what that's like, don't we? The men built Fort Clatsop up inland from the sea. Lewis and Clark worked on their notes and journals. Everyone was bored and ill. On March 23rd, 1806, they started for home. If they didn't reach the Missouri before it froze, they'd be spending another winter in the wilderness. Traveling upstream, the Corps had to lug the canoes around the larger rapids and tow them up the smaller ones. They visited Chief Yellipit and the friendly Walla Walla Indians. Then they moved out overland and set up Camp Chopinish, 50 or 60 miles above the mouth of the Clearwater. Some of the men traded buttons from their uniforms to the Nez Perce for food. Clark traded medical advice and medicines. Chief Twisted Hair returned most of their horses, and on June 15th, they started back over the Lolo Trail. Forced to turn around because the snow was so deep, they set out again on June 24th with three Nez Perce guides. Six days of struggle brought them to Traveler's Rest. There the expedition separated. 
With most of the group, Clark traveled south, then east to explore the Yellowstone River. With a few men, Lewis traveled east to Great Falls, then north to explore Maria's River. On July 27th, Blackfeet Indians tried to steal the rifles belonging to Lewis's party. Two of the Indians were killed. Lewis and Clark caught up with one another on the Missouri on August 12th. Before that, Pierre Cruzat accidentally shot Lewis in the upper thigh while they were hunting. Going downstream on the Missouri was much easier than coming up. The Corps left Charbonneau, Sacagawea, and the baby whom Clark had called Pomp with the Mandans on August 17th. The Mandan chief, Big White, agreed to go along to Washington. The Corps reached St. Louis on September 23rd, 1806. People lined up along the riverbank and cheered. The entire nation had thought the members of the expedition had died in the wilderness. Only President Jefferson had held out hope that Lewis and Clark would return. And I'll read the afterword as you look at this picture. Lewis and Clark gathered information on 178 new kinds of plants, 122 new kinds of animals, and more than 40 Indian tribes. Because of their expedition, trappers and later settlers moved out over what would soon be a nation stretching from coast to coast. Early in 1807, Meriwether Lewis became governor of the Louisiana Territory. He moved to St. Louis, but was never happy in his job. When the War and Treasury Departments questioned his official expenses, he started for Washington on September 4, 1809, to defend himself. On October 11th, traveling through Tennessee, he was found shot to death at Granger's Stand on the Natchez Trail Trace, a narrow wilderness road. It remains unclear whether he killed himself or was murdered. When Lewis became governor, William Clark was appointed Brigadier General of the Louisiana Militia. He married on January 5, 1808, moved to St. Louis, and had five children. In 1813, he was appointed governor of what was now the Missouri Territory, as well as superintendent of Indian Affairs. Governor until Missouri became a state in 1820, he continued to help the Indians afterward. He died in St. Louis in 1838. Before leaving the expedition, Charbonneau and Sacagawea had promised to take John Baptiste to Clark when he was old enough to leave his mother. In 1810, they arrived in St. Louis and Clark arranged for the boys' education. Charbonneau returned to live with the Indians. Sacagawea probably died of putrid fever in 1812, but some still believe she lived on until 1884 and died with her own people, the Shoshones in the far west. York did not return to St. Louis with Clark. His wife belonged to a family near Louisville, Kentucky, and Clark agreed to hire him out in the area so he could be close to her. Eventually, Clark freed York and set him up in a carting business between Nashville and Richmond. The former slave later died of cholera, although some say he journeyed back to the Crow Indians and became a chief. I hope that's how he lived his life, rather than dying of cholera. Here's a picture of him getting shot. <laughs> Poor Lewis got shot by his friend accidentally. And that is the end of this picture book. Next, I'll be reading a book about Sacagawea, or some people pronounce her name Sacagawea. So stay tuned for that. Have a great day.